Christians are known to incessantly preach about hope. It seems that every time that we get together for a celebration of some sort, we're talking about hope. Christmas teaches us that we are to hope. The resurrection gives us hope for the future. The gospel of grace inspires us to have hope. The return of Jesus Christ is our blessed hope. Over and over again, Christians are talking about hope. And you know, the world sort of makes a little fun of that. They sort of think that we are the by and by, pie in the sky type of believers, that we live kind of on a wish fulfillment theology. And the truth is, and I can't believe I forgot to bring her text with me to the pulpit this morning, but the little text that we've consulted to help us with our Advent devotions, written by my former high school student, she takes up the topic of hope, and she says very clearly, I have no idea in where the world puts their hope. Whereas the world might mock us for being a people who are always maybe slightly Pollyannish, the reverse of that is, well, what does the world have to offer? In what are they placing their hope? In a political scheme? In technology? In science improving? I mean, where is the hope of the world? The world is such a shifting sand. And so she alludes to the passages of Scripture that say, we have an anchor for our souls. We have a place in which no matter what transpires in the world, that we can have hope that our footing is secure in Jesus Christ and his promises. Of course, there's a big Christian apologetic there, but there's something even more intriguing than just the narrative and the history of the Bible. God the Father gives his people a token. He gives them a down payment on all of his promises. He indwells them by his Holy Spirit. So this is not just a pep talk. This is not just, come on guys, just hang in there. This is the Lord God Almighty indwelling his people, raising their hopes to heaven. And Christy further goes on in her text and says, we just have to recognize there's a master planner. There is someone who has set out a plan to bring about salvation. And the Christmas story helps us to understand the incarnation. And the Easter story helps us to understand the resurrection. And the Pentecost story helps us to recognize the indwelling of God's Holy Spirit. And so that even those first Christians, which we've documented in our sermons through the gospel, through the book of Acts, were a people who were unstoppable, unflappable. They would be told, stop what you're doing, and they would say, we don't live for your orders anymore. We have a God in heaven who has shown us what truth and reality and what a kingdom is supposed to look like. What you're doing here, it's a shambles. And it's never going to compare to what Jesus Christ can establish on earth. And we have a hope in that. <laughs> Christians are a hopeful people. When they walk in the door of the sanctuary, they say, I hope this is good. I hope, this, I, hope I get something out of this. It's always hoping. You know, my family had uh, intended... And then put our hopes on a little family vacation to take a one-week vacation. We'd hope to do that, but God had ordained other things for us. So that one-week vacation turned into a two-week lockdown and quarantine. But have I lost my hope for the future? I, I understand how uh, frustrating it is to be locked down. It, it, it gets you, what's that, cabin fever? It just, it makes you go a little crazy. 
just don't know why you can't get anything done. But my ultimate hope, and listen, I've been frustrated over a lot of things lately. I don't know if you have been. But my, still, my hope rests in the fact that Jesus Christ is taking to himself a people. He's renewing them. He's redeeming them. He's restoring them. And he's making us fit to be in his presence. And I long for that. At the end of the day, take everything away. Give me Jesus. So I wanted to explore this notion of hope because it is rife through the Old Testament. You take all of the law and the writings and the prophets and you examine for from them a common theme. And what do you receive? You receive the Jewish eschatological hope. Now, this is a sermon series that I haven't yet got you to. <laughs> it's something that I want yet to do with you. Because the Jewish eschatological hope and all of its elements in the Old Testament are echoed again in the New Testament. Whereas the Israelites of the Old Testament were looking forward to an anointed one to be the deliverer and to be the one who sat upon King David's throne and the one who would bring the obedience to the nations. That man was Jesus Christ. And he didn't come to us like we read in the book of Jeremiah. God would say a few times, not holding back. If you don't do what I say, I am coming with fire. An unquenchable fire. And if you don't obey what I've laid out for you, and in this particular instance, in Jeremiah 17, highlighting the Sabbath day, which was the token of their relationship with God. It was to communicate to the world, we have a relationship with God and we rest in His provision. And we look to him to supply us for our need. And that our life is not 24-7 work. The concept of worship must be focused in our life. And the gift of the Sabbath was God saying, Come to me, all ye who are heavy laden and labor, and take upon yourself my yoke in a unique way to say, please don't spend your life working and working and working and never realizing that you were created to worship. You were created to work for everything constantly. You were created for God. And his gift of a Sabbath day would be a reminder that we are in relationship with him. And in that particular context, he says, just stop carrying stuff on the Sabbath. Recognize you belong to me. And I to you. But if you don't, fire. <laughs> and so we suspect Jesus Christ coming. And John the Baptist anticipating this one for whom he is making the path straight. The ones which the mountains are going to be lowered and the valleys are going to be raised. The one who is going to bring an unquenchable fire. John the Baptist knew the type of prophet, Messiah, anointed one that was coming. And he said, clean up. <laughs> Let's just hurry up and wash up because you can't stand in the way of this coming one. And yet when he appears, every measure of lowliness and humility and embarrassment is connected to his what to his life. My famous line about Elizabeth and Mary talking to one another. Christmas is about a woman who couldn't get pregnant and a woman who shouldn't have been pregnant and all of the complications related to that. And that's how Jesus entered into the world. Lowly but pure and undefiled. And to establish that he was truly the anointed one of God. And who at the end of the day, the fire of judgment was placed upon himself. All those forsaken passages that make you cringe 
about what God would do to Israel, God poured all of that upon Jesus Christ so that he could look to us and extend to us every single blessing passage for an obedient Israel. We're, we're supposed to be trees that are planted by the river whose roots do not wither. Even if drought comes, even if heat comes, we will produce fruit in season, out of season, because we are in Christ. So this brings us to a little example of how the new Israel lives today. And so if you have your scriptures with you, I'm inviting you to turn to the book of Titus. It's three books, and I wanted just to highlight how the Old Testament Jewish eschatological hope is now also the blessed hope of the Christian. We, like Old Testament Israel, are longing for the anointed one to appear. He has come in his first advent, and he's left us a token of his redeeming power by the work of the Holy Spirit in us. But he has yet promised to return again. And so we fix our gaze upon him, not upon our circumstances, not upon our frailties, not upon our sins, because we take our sins and we bring them to him and he cleanses us. So the book of Titus begins with, as a letter written to a young pastor, the Apostle Paul, writes to a young servant. In verse 1 he says, Paul, a bond servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth which accords with godliness in hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie promised before time began. So in Paul's introduction to Titus and with the anticipation that this would be read to the church, the church over which he's overseeing, Paul illustrates the doctrinal truth of God's sovereign rule to elect a people to himself, and that these people would have a godly lifestyle, and that these people would have a hope for eternal life. Now, we use the word hope all the time. I remember being uh, educated as a journalist in my communications classes. And I remember the day the professor said to us, now when you do your reporting, you never use the word hope because it means you're choosing sides. And I thought, don't I hope that the little baby gets pulled from the well? He says, use different language. You, you describe the technicalities of what needs to happen to take that child out of the well. But you can't invest yourself in your story. You have to be objective. Well, is anyone's hope objective? We're always hoping that things will get better. We're always hoping that something good will transition. Or, if we can't get the good, we hope that the bad that's supposed to come to people, they get what they're supposed to get. But the New Testament church and those who are followers of Jesus Christ have a category called eternal life. The reality of eternal life completely <clears throat> modifies everything we do in this life because we live as though it is a reality. And so when we are tempted, when people try to persuade us to do things that are unholy, we stop and we say, no, -uh, this doesn't belong to my nature. It does not belong to my purposes because there's something more important coming than what we're experiencing right now. But what's coming in the future is going to be just like what I'm feeling right now. But I will be renewed and empowered and I will give praise to God for, for he is due. So in his writing to the church and to his young minister, he wants his people to put hope in eternal life. And of course, eternal life has been secured for us because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then he goes on to talk about what his mission is in the book of Titus. And you'll see the chapter divisions there that there's a discussion of elders and 
who's qualified to be an elder. And what the elders' task is and how they are to oversee the church. And just as we would read from the book of Jeremiah about the importance of the Sabbath, equally so we would read in a book to a young pastor how important it is to have proper leadership. In the Old Testament, you ask the question, why would you cut corners on the Sabbath? Why would you try to get out of keeping the Sabbath? And of course, everyone comes up with justification. Well, because I need to do this to be prepared for the next week. Or, you know, you know how we all make excuses about why we sin. And in an equal vein, the question is, why wouldn't you as a church have men who lead the church that reflect these passages? Why would you do that? What would come, what, com what comes from the Old Testament breaking the Sabbath, and what comes from the New Testament taking shortcuts on your leadership? And so there's a, an important imperative for those who lead churches, because the church is the bride of Christ. It is the elect of God. It is an extension of his kingdom. And then there's this wonderful echo of what we expect of the elders really is to be expected throughout all of the congregation. And so you see a list here in chapter 2 of, of how older men and older women and young women and husbands and children and young men and even bond servants, the very word servant that Paul uses of himself, how they're to interact with one another. To understand what their place is, how they are to be compatible in their relationships. All of them, whatever you are in life, you are to express integrity and reverence and sound speech that cannot be condemned. So, the church isn't just about exalting the most wonderful leaders, which we should, wonderful, humble people who care about what God's word says, but the whole congregation is supposed to aspire to this. And then he goes on to discuss what this type of church would anticipate for the future. This is chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. What type of men? All kinds of men. He just gave us a big list of all the types of people that he will call to himself. Verse 12, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Why does he care about how we live in this present age? Because there's an age yet to come. And if you believe that there is yet an age to come, it would greatly impact how you lived in this age. Isn't that all of our fear? Of the people who go to the places of legislation or in the judiciary part of our world who might suspect that there's not an age to come and they will just rule and legislate for this age right now. Because there sure is a tendency for those people to line their own pockets and find their own convenience and advance their own agendas. My agenda is always going to be selfish. But my agenda has to be matched with what's going to bring God glory? What's going to bring truth to the world? It's not about what it's going to cost me. It's about how does God get glorified in this? Well, if you believe in an age to come and your hope rests in that, that greatly impacts how we live. And so he says in verse 13, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, 
who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. And you've got to take all of that language and you've got to parse it out and you've got to hold in your mind this is a group of people that God never got to have in the Old Testament. The people of the Old Testament squandered their inheritance. The people of the Old Testament were unredeemed. <laughs> they lived lawless lives. They did not purify themselves. And you know what? None of us could either if not for Jesus Christ. And that's why Christmas brings hope. Because everything that God expects of us, we don't have it in us. So we've got to look to the one who can fulfill what God had intended to bring to his people in Christ. It's his redeeming love for his elect. It's his purifying righteousness for his elect. That will cause a people to be zealous for good works and he would say, verse 15, speak these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority, let no one despise you. You're a young pastor. People are going to say, hey, wait a minute, you're not old enough to understand the world yet. Paul says, no, we understand the world. Jesus Christ runs the world. And we're going to obey Jesus Christ as a church. And that gives me rights. And guess what, brothers and sisters, you have rights over me. If I'm doing something that transgresses God's law and His purposes, we've got to let iron sharpen iron. <laughs> we've got to let we've got to let people disciple one another. And of course, we know the passage of Titus concludes in chapter three with this powerful, powerful gospel reality. Verse four of chapter three. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. We are still a very forward-thinking people. And we look to the Old Testament, and we look to the New Testament, and we see how God was faithful there, and we know He's going to be faithful in our future. And when we look at what salvation is, and we see that we're justified by His grace, and not by our doings, Peter would say, your salvation is kept safe in heaven for you. It's up there in heaven, so you can't get your hands on it and mess it up. So here's where the hope of Christmas is realized. In this very Trinitarian outline that deals with the salvation of God the Father and His plans, God the Son and His provision, and God the Holy Spirit in His application. That the phrase choose hope is not a political line. It is the reality for the believer. How, how, how did uh, Handel write it? The trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall all be he, he had a stuttering problem. <laughs> but that's, that is our hope. We're corrupted. We're broken clay vessels. But God has poured his spirit into us to renew us, to redeem us, to restore us. My closing point is why hope is so important and why Jesus brings it relates to his sermon that he preached in the Gospel of Luke, where he goes to the synagogue, and they open up the scroll of Isaiah, 
and he reads a passage and he says, greatest sermon ever, right? Today, in your hearing, this passage is fulfilled. And what passage did he read? He read Isaiah 61. And all I read is about people who are in terrible, desperate situations. They're all in situations where they're going to say, I'm done. I'm spent. There is no hope. There's absolutely no hope in the situation I'm in. And that's the relief of what Jesus Christ brings to us. We don't look at the background, which is dark, austere, pointless, hopeless, uncontrollable. We look at the relief of the stars and the brightness of what Jesus Christ brings to us. Listen to this passage. You tell me that Jesus did not come to bring hope when you hear about every circumstances he came to rectify. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. There's the Jewish eschatological hope that an anointed one would come to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the great day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning. The passage goes on. But you see very clearly why we need hope. <laughs> because outside of him we are broken, we are captive, we are bound. He has come to free us, and free us indeed. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we ask that your spirit would speak to us about this living hope, how it does transform your people, not because they've learned southern hospitality or they've been to cotillion classes. Lord, this is about a transformation of understanding who we are and what you've come to do in us, through us by the Savior Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. And Lord, our hope rests not on our performance, but upon the one who is faithful and true to fulfill all the promises. And he will return with those promises in hand one day. We thank you for that day and look forward to the, that day. Maranatha. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.